Dave, you were there in the Anaheim Pond to see Shawn Michaels versus Bret Hart go Broadway, as they used to say, 60 minutes in the Iron Man match, first time it's ever happened at WrestleMania, perhaps the last time it will ever happen at WrestleMania. What were your thoughts on this match, taking it in as it happened? I mean, it's a funny thing because I've got my dual stories on, on that one because I saw it live and then I went home and watched very, you know, the, on TV and it was two different feelings. Um, mm. In the building, the people at, in the lower part of the building, and I was not in the lower part of the building. I, I happened to get my tickets from one of the biggest stars in the company whose name won't be mentioned, and he was – and it was it was way up. So I was in the upper deck with the people who didn't care at all. Um, and, you know, about that, this match, they were just – I mean, it was it – was, it was terrible. People were leaving early. I'm not saying the match was terrible. The reaction was terrible. When I then watched it on TV and you see the reaction of the people, and I could even tell watching it that the people on the bottom were, um, you know, they were liking it a lot more than the people where I was sitting. And even after the show, I remember, um, you know, some people came up and it was just like, you know, they were going like, ah, it was a good match. I mean, nobody was saying it was a great match. It was a good match and this and this. And I'm going like, where we were sitting, this match was was boring and people were walking out, mm. you know. And, and I know technically it was good. Well, then, you know, I watched it. I went home and watched it on TV, and I, I actually thought it was a pretty good match. Um, I don't think, you know, when people t- talk about it as like the, one of the greatest wrestling, you know, WrestleMania matches of all time, or greatest sixty-minute matches, or something like that. I, I've never, even even the TV version, I I, I never thought it was like that. Um, hmm. I mean, the building, em- you know, the building was, I would say, about a quarter empty by the time that match was over and when Sean was doing a celebration, everybody was gone. The people didn't stay. I mean, it was not a great way in the building. If you were in the building for Sean to kick off his reign. In fact, I thought it was horribly disappointing. Um, in that sense, you know, the people in the building, honest to God, the people in the building were there for ultimate warriors comeback. They, they were not that hot for Brett and Sean. Um, I think that, you know, in, in time, you know, Brett and Sean became much, much bigger stars, um, and, you know, it's funny because Brett was always strong in, a, in the Los Angeles market and Sean later became strong in that market as well. But, you know, the you know, the, whatever it was, it was a very ultimate warrior crowd that night live. Hmm. Um, is there any truth to the rumor that neither Brett nor Sean wanted to be the first to lose a fall? And so that's why they decided to go uh, to the sudden death overtime. No, no. no, it was this was this was Brett's booking <clears throat> and. Brett had the idea that we'll cross people up by not doing a fall um, and then doing it the way they did it. I think Brett was a little bit, you know, the idea that he would have the sharpshooter on at the end, which actually I thought was pretty darn good because the idea was was for Sean to win the title. But and Brett was going to leave, but leave that linger of doubt that Brett kind of got screwed. And when Brett came back, which they were all expecting, then you can go to Brett and Sean as the main event for the next year, which at the time was the plan, which it didn't Mm. happen. Um, so, so I, I, as far as like the, I, I thought, you know, I, I did think live and I even think now that I, I would have liked to have seen three falls each, you know, a lot of falls mm-hmm. and, and, and have, um, you know, it'd be the tie Brett have the sharp, you know, I, I thought the Brett having the sharpshooter on the bell ringing him, not winning and then going in overtime and losing. I like, I really like that, that idea of it. Um, mm-hmm. but I would have, you know, even four falls, you know, but go in with, with, with an even number. I, I think anything less than four wouldn't, you know, two would have been too few even. I think four falls would have worked. Six falls would have worked. Eight falls would have been too many. So, but, but zero falls, uh, I didn't think it was the right idea. Yeah. Cause at that point, why not just have it be a one fall match and just go an hour? You know, why go, why make it an Iron Man match? Why not just say here? Well, because if it, was an, if it was an hour match, then at the hour, it would actually be a draw. But with the Iron Man match, part of the stipulation of the Iron Man match is it's a must be a winner match. Oh, I suppose, yeah. And so a must be a winner match necessitates the overtime, even though Brett walked out with the idea that he didn't know that, you know, it was it was kind of established. Whereas, like, we've seen hour matches, and when the hour is up, it's not like they go, well, there must be a winner now, go back, go back out there. Um, yeah. So that that was the reason. Do you feel like part of the false finish there, Dave, so to speak, was to keep Brett strong? Um, do you think that? Oh, absolutely, it was yeah. to keep Brett. Strong. Yeah, yeah, because they were trying to build for the the idea that he had a, you know, they were both baby faces. So the idea was Sean won and Sean pinned him, and and he got his win and he got his celebration. But Brett, you know, they wanted the Brett fans to think Brett got screwed, and they wanted the debate, and they wanted it to, you know. It's, it's, it's hard to headline two straight WrestleManias, and they didn't do it because Vince panicked. But then and also, well, I shouldn't, you know, they're Vince panicked, A, and, and uh, more important, Sean wasn't there for the next year's WrestleMania, which is another story. Yeah. But, but um, <laughs> Which we'll get to. Yes, yes, of course. Um, but, yeah, no, yeah, it was definitely to, to, to 
build, you know, to win the title. But they, the, the idea was absolutely build a rematch, um, you know, because uh, they're the two best guys. So this was Shawn Michaels' uh, crowning achievement in so many ways, played up as sort of the ultimate coronation in, in the WWF tradition of the new guy, the new face. And I'm thinking to WrestleMania 11, where he is sort of positioned as the headliner against Diesel. I think back to WrestleMania 10 when he breaks through in 94 with, with the ladder match. When did you, Dave, start to feel like Sean was on the path to becoming the guy, to becoming someone who would be coronated in such a way on the biggest night of the year for the WWF? Uh, remember when he did the thing with Owen Hart, the angle where, yep. where he was, where, you know, after the Syracuse thing, they played up that he was, his career was over and that he may have suffered horrible injuries. Right. He was attacked in a fight and he got a concussion and then they had Owen kick him in the head on raw and act yeah. like that was the reason. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They played off the concussion, which they never had really uh, publicized too much. I mean, I guess they did to a degree because he had to vacate the intercontinental title to Dean Douglas and he missed a pay-per-view out of it. But, um, so people knew about it and they, you know, they, they tried to make that a shoot, so to speak, you know, where you really believed that, that he was really hurt and he was making this comeback. When Sean came back from that, I really noticed that Sean could draw and it was hard, you know, his business wasn't good um, for anyone to draw. Sean, when he came back, the numbers went up and that's when I thought, you know what, um, you know, Sean, I, I, I don't, I, 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 I thought Sean could be world champion and I, and I thought Sean would probably be world champion the year before because I thought he had more than Nash and, and you know even Nash himself will will say in certain ways Sean sabotaged him in the spotlight uh, um, you know in that match they had even though they're best friends mm -hmm. but um, you know on that night you know you could even tell when, in the sense that there were certain moments and, and Sean I think probably didn't know what he was doing uh, where you could feel that there was um, even though Sean was the heel and remember they turned him the next day anyway because he got so many babyface cheers that you could feel you know and Sean was so much better than than Nash as a wrestler and 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 at, and the, the big guy thing wasn't really working so even then I would say that I saw that he's probably going to win the championship um, at some point uh, at that WrestleMania, even before that WrestleMania. When this thing was being built up, it was very clear where it was going. Um, but when he came back and he started to draw, that's when I was thinking, like, you know, we got a guy who can draw, and he's a fantastic wrestler, and, and uh, he can be, you know, he can be that face of the company right now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that that would be when the, the comeback from the, the fake concussion thing was was mm -hmm. probably when I really saw that, that he could be bigger than he ever was. Now, uh during the uh, the free for all pre show for WrestleMania 12, the uh, WWE showed the culmination of the billionaire Ted Raslin War Room skits. Uh, could you comment on the skits leading up to the show and the quote unquote payoff? I just remember thinking that it sucked, but I thought they all sucked. <laughs> I thought they were all. I thought I thought that they were all like really really hypocritical and mean spirited. Um, yeah. you know, especially because it's, it's, I mean, I know Vince was trying to fight and he was, you know, at this point already, you know, he's, he's, he's losing the fight. Um, you know, he ended up winning it, but he was losing at this point. And I just thought, you know, so much of that stuff of like, look, these guys, you, you were kicking these guys ass for whatever it was, 11 years, 12 years. And they never, you know, and then the minute, you know, you, you know, and, and, and you did everything to them that they're doing to you, you know, take the town, blah, blah, blah. And so now it's coming back. And, and I just, you know, that and and just the, you know, again, the knocking of Hogan and Savage after all the money they made him. I mean, I think that's, you know, you know, and then, you know, again, for Vince to knock people on the steroid thing, granted, they were drug testing and they were probably um, in in in. Uh, you know, they still they hadn't they had I don't think that they they dropped the drug testing. I think it was like 96, if I remember. But but um, so it was right. You know, they were right about to drop it, but but they were doing it at the time. So they were the cleanest. I, I would say they were the cleanest that company ever was, was was right at that time. So they could do that. But it's also like, my God, though, you know, it's like, what did you build the company around? And now you're you're knocking Hogan and Savage for being so big. And it's like, that's how they made you all the money that they made yeah. you. And and. Just Randy with Elizabeth and everything, you know, that, that was a real sore subject, you know, and, and again, like if I know that Hulk and Randy, you know, were, were did not like it at all. Um, and I just felt, you know, like I, I, I appreciate there were there were no, I, I will say that there were some of the skits, the one with Elizabeth in the shoe and everything that I thought was hilarious. <laughs> um, I did like actually I probably liked half the skits, but the ones where they um, 
the ones that I felt were mean spirited, um, I think all rubbed me the wrong way. And I just remember, I don't actually specifically remember the last one at Maney because they all blend together, they, but I do they, remember they all, they all died. Yeah, but what I do remember is being in the in the building in Los Angeles when they did the last skit, and I don't remember which one it was, but I remember that it was a very embarrassing thing in the sense that I'm talking the first four or five rows. These are the WWF diehards. They got up and clapped and gave it a standing ovation, and everyone else in the building is just like looking at each other going like, oh, God, this was really bad. <laughs> so So, yeah, it didn't work in the building at all. So this would be the year, Dave, 1996, where Scott Hall, who works as Razor Ramon, was supposed to work as Razor Ramon on the show against Goldust in the Hollywood right, Backlot Brawl. Mm-hmm. Takes off, Piper fills in. Yeah. And, and uh, Kevin Nash has his goodbye match, so to speak. Well, actually, he goes on to work Sean the next month at the April pay-per-view, but has his last WrestleMania match here against The Undertaker of this run. And then they jump to WCW, and the NWO forms, and the WWF is challenged like never before. My question is, did you see the business changing the way it did when Hall and Nash jumped? Did they feel like big enough players in this point in 1996 in the WWF to make such an impact just by jumping to WCW? I knew it would be an impact. I, I can't say I thought it would be as big as it was, but I mean, as far as being able to beat WW, WCW, I mean, WWF, I mean, they were already dueling them equally on Monday and they were presenting a better product. So the idea, and I would see my friends and they would go, you know, like it was like, you know, you, oh God, you know, there's, there's so, the, the WWF is so old and slow, not old so much, but God, the wrestling in WWF is so slow compared to the wrestling in WCW. I would hear it all the time. So I could feel the momentum and that didn't have with Hall and Nash. That had to do with the different product. I mean, WCW was so ahead of the curve when it came to the in-ring wrestling, you know, because again, we had gotten in, you know, in the nineties, the United States had, had, I, I used to say, I and mean, it was the truth, you know, the U S was, was from 1984, you know, as big as Japan was, and Japan was big, um, but from 1984 to probably 90, 91, the U.S. was the the place, you know, was where you could make the most money um, and all that. From 1992 until the Monday Night Wars just heated up our business, um, you know, we were we were a third world country. I mean, I would go to Mexico and wrestling was way bigger and wrestling was way better. I'd go to Japan. I mean, we weren't even in the league of those places, WWF and WCW. You know, people were, oh, you know, like in, in you know, in, in our country, it's like they were number one and number two. It's just like AAA was was New Japan and all Japan. They were, you know, even FMW, which I wouldn't, you know, necessarily, you know, as crazy as it was. I mean, these people were doing stadium shows. And we were struggling. You know, we were we weren't filling we weren't filling basketball arenas. Nobody was, and they're doing stadium shows. So we were a third world country. And part of it was they were ahead. You know, re, you know, their wrestling was was uh, faster and it was ahead of the curve, so to speak. And Vince was stuck in his own way with the big guy mentality and the big slow stuff. And the crowd wanted something different. They wanted the big bumps and everything like that. And then WCW. They brought those guys in. They made that deal with New Japan, um, which, you know, brought in the Ligers and you had the Liger Pillman thing, which was the beginning of something. And then more, you know, they brought in all the Mexicans and you had Rey Mysterio, which took everything in a completely different direction. And it was just, you know, they they had that element that WWF was was behind the ball on. And I think that that was um, that was a lot of it. So but but um, as far as Hall and Nash, I, I mean, they were two key guys. At, at, an, at an important time, I did think that they would be difference makers. But when I remember going to a house show with, at WCW, this was before the real turnaround, um, before Hogan joined the NWO, but Hall and Nash were there. And it was really interesting to see just how big at a WCW show Hall and Nash were. And it really like, surprised me that they were bigger than any of the WCW stars. And that's when it was like, wow, these guys are, um, you know, these guys are a real big deal. And what lured them? Money. There it is. I thought you know, so. Money, I mean, it's that schedule. You know, I mean, you know, schedule's part of it, but they, I mean, Scott was making 400 and I believe he was offered 650 mm-hmm. I always thought it was 750 but I actually have seen the numbers now. He was, he, he was offered 650 but it was also 650 for maximum 180 dates, and he was probably, I don't know that he was working 300 but he was probably working, you know, 
over 250 mm-hmm. for as, as far as real numbers went and they were never home and never seeing their family and this and that so it was it was sanity and more money and nash you know was offered 750 because nash was making more money than, than hall and wcw so it, it took more money and he's also the smarter businessman anyway and they had escalators and all that where they were going to you know get raises and things like that and they ended, up, they ended up making a killing during the next you know whatever it was from up through about 2001 you know because they they even made money you know, they even made money the year the WCW folded for another year. Um, so, so you know, money was the key thing. Schedule was part of it. Um, so, yeah, those were those were the two things. And, and Eric Bischoff had seen the, uh, you know, he went to the Tokyo Dome for the um, UWF, one of the UWF versus New Japan shows, and kind of saw that Invader thing and the incredible heat. And J.J. Dillon had gone there and seen it as well. And so they were there, you know. Luckily for them, they were there to see this thing. And unlike Vince, who, you know, the, the mentality of I've got to keep my brand strong and I can't make these outsiders look good. Eric went in the other direction. Mm-hmm. You know, Eric was just like, you know, we're going to just give these guys everything and make our guys look like shit, which which was probably too much. But in, in the short run, it actually was beneficial. In the long run, it probably killed the company. You mentioned being in the building that night and knowing that most of the people were there for the return of the Ultimate Warrior. Now, it was a short-lived return after Warrior was fired from the WWF in 92 after making the WrestleMania 8 comeback that we've recapped here in The Lapsed Fan. What is the story behind Warrior's 1996 return and why it all flamed out so quickly? Um, two reasons. I think that, number one, it was just a different era and it was, it was a nostalgia thing. And it was, you know, you could, you could see when he came back, like that first night was just huge. But it always, you know, something like that should be huge right i mean look at every time hogan came back um you know it was really huge but but it doesn't have legs all the nostalgia things are like that and he was a he was a nostalgia character at by that point um so it you know once he was on the road for a while you know he was still selling merchandise and he was still popular but he wasn't moving the needle like they expected and then you know him and vince had you know all kinds of problems um the big one being that uh he you know, he had a comic book that he wanted Vince to buy all kinds of copies and sell it at the arena, and Vince said no. So he said he was going to no-show some dates if Vince didn't do it. He no-showed th- those dates. Vince essentially, you know, essentially fired him. He complained that it was – his father actually died that weekend uh, by coincidence. Um, so the whole thing was is that I, my father died. That's why I didn't go to the shows. And Vince thought, no, you held me up. And I said no, and then you no-showed like you said you were going to do. So you had that – thing and at that point you know again he wasn't he wasn't making the difference in business and he was a headache and so vince cut the cord and of course the guy he worked that night warrior that is was triple h making his wrestlemania debut here at 1996 and of course would go on to great fame and fortune and influence in the industry also that's 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 also a great story because triple h went to that building you know thinking that that he was going to have a, a match with the ultimate warrior and when he got there, Ultimate Warrior, you know, told him what the match was going to be. Mm-hmm. And, and and he was on the ascent at the time. And the idea of going in there and being a 90-second job guy was not what he was thinking was his role. I mean, you know, he knew he was going to lose that match, and he should have at that point. It was the showcase for the Warrior. But he thought, you know, he could be the guy to carry the guy and, yeah. and kind of get something out of it. And and Warrior had no such thing. And, you know, Warrior – and, I mean, Triple H would, would knock Warrior forever, even though at the end, I guess, they – they did in the last six months of Warrior's life end up becoming friends. I, I believe that. I know some people are skeptical of that. I mean, I know people who are close who just goes, oh, you know, he hates him. And I go, you know, I mean, maybe he does. But I, I, you know, I felt, you know, that they negotiated and I felt, you know, maybe maybe he did like him at the end. But, you know, he, you know, they went through years of, of you know, he would call him the most unprofessional guy he ever worked with. And also a very significant debut, to say the very least on the WrestleMania stage here in 1996 was that of Stone Cold Steve Austin, who worked Savio Vega. Of course, he came in as the ringmaster in 1995. By this point, the Stone Cold character, the bald head, the black trunks, etc., the harder nose style was starting to emerge. What did you think, Dave, of Stone Cold's sort of initial tenure in the WWF before he really broke through? What, what was it that finally connected and hit with him? Okay, my thoughts when he came in as the ringmaster with a bald head with Ted DiBiase was... I was so disappointed because because Steve Austin was such a good wrestler in WCW and he'd gotten a bad hand dealt to him when Hogan came in and those guys didn't know him and they wanted to bring their buddies in from the past and they just didn't know this guy and and uh you know they saw him as a a worker who wasn't a star so they just wanted to get rid of him and they did you know I mean you know um not necessarily get him fired 
um, that was his doing in, in a lot of ways, you know, by, uh, you know, not showing up at a TV taping and holding up another TV taping and, and different, different things that he did at the time. But, but, um, you know, I thought in WWF, you know, the guy's really good and he's main, he's main event talent. And he went in there with Ted DiBiase and it wasn't working at all. And it was just like, oh man, this guy's, you know, he's one of those guys like Barry Windham or something where you just go like, you know, in WCW, you think that this guy's going to be it. And then he goes to WWF and he's just nothing. Um, then when he changed, it was like it was for the better. But I will say it at WrestleMania 96, uh, no, no. I, I, I mean, I, I certainly knew it before before SummerSlam of 90s. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Survivor Series of 96 when he wrestled Brett. Yeah. Certainly before that. Um, probably when um, what was what, the Pillman stuff would have been, what, the summer? I mean, certainly by the Pillman stuff when I saw the – the work he did in the Pillman stuff, I knew he was going to be a really big deal. Of course, as big as he got to be, of course not. You know, I nobody nobody knew that. I mean, I don't think I really knew how big he was going to be. My first thing about big he was going to be was when he was in the ring with uh, Mike Tyson and and held his own verbally and and physically didn't feel intimidated. And you know, that's when I really um, saw he was going to be gigantic. When I saw he was going to be big baby face, would have been. Um, I mean, early in the year before the Brett match, I mean, the Brett match in, at the next WrestleMania put him over the top and I knew he was going to be a top guy, but he was already in my mind, a top guy when, when he had the, when he had the Brett match at, at SummerSlam at the garden, I mean, uh, Survivor Series at the garden, right? Wasn't it the Brett match? Survivor yes. Series? Yep. Yeah. Right, right, right. So that night, I mean, I knew this guy was going to be a top guy and a top main eventer and the top heel in the company and, and all that, um, uh, main event guy, strong main event guy, um, with the, Brett match the next year, I knew he was going to be even bigger as a baby face and a solid top baby face. But the Tyson thing was when when it was like, okay, this guy's going to be, you know, the, you know, the next Hulk, you know, I guess I don't say the next Hulk Hogan, but a Hulk Hogan level guy, you know, where, you know, where it's it's a big time difference maker and, and game changer. 